foundation of the ecosystem. This is sponsored by the Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute. And it's, it's also sponsored by the Umatilla National Forest, the Wasco County Soil and Water Conservation District, Union Soil and Water Conservation District, and Eastern Oregon State College. My name is Bill Malarkey. I'm the coordinator for the seminar series. And with me is Jim McKeever, our co-host for the seminar series. Jim is the director of the Learning Center of the Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute. And Jim is going to explain a little bit about the seminar series that we're about to see. Thanks, Bill. Um, the Blue Mountains Institute uh, does these seminar series um, to try to take the information that we have out there that is uh, somewhat obscure in some, in some cases and get it out there so the maximum uh, audience can see it. Uh, this is the fourth uh, seminar series that we have done in the last two years. Uh, uh, this one on soils. Uh, this evening we begin with Soil Structure and Function uh, by Al Harvey. I'll introduce him in just a bit. Uh, next week we'll continue with uh, looking at soil development. We'll talk about the geology of soils, uh, uh, what the relation is between geology and soils, and also the uh, organic and inorganic soil formation. Uh, on the 20th of October, our third session, we'll look at the organisms of the soil. We'll look at the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, nematodes, and arthropods that contribute to soil function. On the 27th, the fourth and final uh, evening, we'll look at soil management, uh, the effects of management activities on poor soils, and uh, can we manage better. We also have a field trip planned on the 22nd of October uh, that I think uh, Bill is going to tell you about uh, in more depth later. Uh, and this uh, field trip is open to, to anybody who wants to come. That's the 22nd of October. That's about it for the, the series. I'll introduce Al Harvey just after Bill takes care of some housekeeping. Okay, some of the things that I want to be sure that you understand mm -hmm. is that we do have sign-up sheets as we've had in the past. It's really important for you folks to sign those here and at the remote sites as well. We keep a record of the uh, attendance and we also get the people on the mailing list that aren't there already. Another thing that we've got are handouts in the back of the room and uh, at all the remote sites. Some of our handouts are of limited uh, numbers, so be sure and uh, want those. I mean, take those if you can really use those. Uh, one example is uh, the soil survey that we've got uh, from the Union County. And if you can see that on our overhead projector, every county has a soil survey, and you can get that from the, your local SCS office or uh, uh, Soil and Water Conservation District office. Uh, those are at each site as well, just one example. We've also got some uh, uh, posters that would really be good for teachers to take. So if, if we have teachers in the audience, be sure and pick one of those up. We've also got, uh, we've got several copies of a publication that was uh, uh, Al Harvey who is the principal author and one of our local men, uh, Mike Geist, is uh, a co-author in that paper. And Robert Maurice, who is our final speaker, is an author of the paper and it's Biotic and Abiotic Processes in Eastside Ecosystems. We've got several copies of that, so uh, again, pick those up if you really want to learn more in depth about what we're talking about. Very good publications. Uh, another thing, uh, we are offering college credit through Eastern Oregon State College again this year, or this uh, series. And be sure and pick up your registration forms. And when you make out your checks, make those payable to Eastern Oregon State College and send those to the Learning Center here in La Grande. And the address is uh, 10901 Island Avenue in La Grande. Uh, we'll keep you posted on that if you have any questions later. As far as, uh, as the requirements for the course, uh, it's, a, it's a critique or a summary of each presentation, about two paragraphs. And then for the people that are relatively close, like in Baker City, Enterprise, and Pendleton, we definitely want to have you attend the, uh, the tour on the 22nd. And for those people that can't possibly make it, we're going to select uh, a report or publication on soils and have you write a, a critique on that publication. And we'll have that to uh, the people that sign up uh, by the 13th or the 20, 22nd. Uh, another thing that we're going to have again available this time is uh, the videotape series. They were very popular last time. 
particularly for those people that couldn't get to a remote site to see the series. And uh, they'll be offered for $30 this time. It's a little increase from last time, but Eastern Oregon State College is handling that, and they couldn't afford to do it for $20. Uh, for those of you folks that aren't at the established remote sites, and we know that there are some, we would like to have the people in the Forest Service uh, jot us a note on their data general systems and let us know where you're receiving it. There could be people from out of state um, as far as Montana receiving the seminar series. We're delighted to have you and if we know you're out there we could get some information to you. So uh, the other people that don't have the data general system could just jot us a note at the Learning Center. Format for this evening is uh, we have about uh, 40 to 45 minutes that uh, our speaker will uh, present his information and then we'll take questions and answers. We're not going to take an official break, but if you really need to take a break, and that's a long time, to sit in one spot, uh, do it fairly discreetly. And uh, for the people at remote sites, we won't know if you leave or not, so just, you know, have at it. And while you're, while you're listening to our speaker, write down your questions so you don't forget those. Uh, one of the things that we'll have difficulty, or we've had difficulty with at EdNet One remote sites, is getting people to ask questions. And you have an audio bridge, all you need to do is push the button and you can uh, talk directly to our uh, presenter and ask him those questions. The people from Walla Walla can call the direct line and, and those numbers will be posted when that, that is available for you to do. Uh, I believe that's about all I've got to say here, but uh, we're going to have a good series and Jim's going to introduce our speaker and we'll get rolling. Okay, Alan Harvey is with us tonight. He is a uh, plant pathologist for the uh, USDA Forest Service, the Intermountain Research Station in Moscow, Idaho. His current work deals with ecosystem processes, microbial functions, and forest health. Uh, he has gone to several schools and been trained at several uh, institutions, the College of Idaho, the University of Idaho, and he received his PhD from Washington State University in 1967. Uh, since 1965, he's been with the Forest Service at uh, various labs, primarily Missoula and in Moscow, and uh, he's worked on all sorts of things associated with uh, soils. The title of his presentation tonight is Soil and the Forest Floor, What It Is and How It Works. Please welcome Alan Harvey. Thanks, guys. Okay, uh, what I want to do is get started uh, right away with the slide series and we'll go through a slideshow and uh, this stuff tends to be a little information dense guys so uh, you have to be sort of on your toes. Uh, don't worry about uh, specific numbers. Uh, as we go through look at trends, uh, the relative values of one thing to another. Uh, specific numbers aren't very important most of the time. When they are, I'll discuss them specifically. So if we can get started with the first slide. See, I need to be able to see those slides. Can I uh, pull this? Got it. Okay. Hey, here we go. All right. Lots of technology. I want to call your attention first and foremost. As you look at this, we've already discussed what the title is. Down at the lower right hand corner there, I make mention that forest soils develop in place. That is something that's very, very unique with soils, uh, particularly in forests. Uh, they're not like agricultural soils at all. Uh, forest soils, most of them, rarely get physically displaced. They're not plowed. They, they very seldom move from one place to the other. Uh, there are a few forests where tip overs, tree tip overs, uh, does a pretty fair job of plowing soils. But that's rare, particularly in the inland northwest. So I uh, want to just emphasize that uh, with these title slides. So first of all, let's talk about what a soil is in a rough sense, a uh, simplistic sense, if you will. Uh, before I get into the real organic matter, 
business that we're, we're slated to talk about tonight, though I want to call your attention to the fact that the physical process of what goes on beneath the forest floor is very, very important. This happens to be one of the, the nicest soil profiles, one of the more interesting soil profiles I've ever run across. It happens to be from New Mexico. Starting at the top, you can see some, some glacial till uh, of an old soil profile. Below that, you have two ash falls. In between, there's a black layer. That was once a forest. The second ash fall there eliminated that forest. And then below there, glacial till again. It's a rather interesting profile. What's more interesting about it is if you look around the backside of that hill, where you have volcanic ash, you have Douglas fir and white fir. Where you don't, you have lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine. And this is just a good example of what can happen below that forest floor that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. Forest soils are very complicated animals, and it is well not to forget that. And when I'm through, I will be presenting something that's relatively simplistic, as I say, but, but these soils are highly variable. They can be a whole different ball game just several feet away. So it's very difficult working with soils from the standpoint of sampling because variation is extremely high. By and large, in inland western forest soils, they're very shallow. They're relatively infertile. Uh, you see the organic horizon here is only a couple inches thick. That is characteristic of most of the inland northwest. When we take soil samples, this is what we generally see in terms of horizons. Uh, starting at the stop, at the top you have the litter, underlain by humus, with scattered decomposed wood throughout the soil profile both laying on top of and incorporated in. This is something when we first began to look, we were quite surprised by. But there are very substantial volumes of this stuff in most of our inland western forest soils. You hear a lot of terminology being bantered around in forest soil science, and it's real easy to get lost in it sometimes. So I generated this computer graphic, and I had a little problems with one computer talking to another here, but it still serves the purpose pretty well. Uh, there's a number of, of names that you hear kicked around. Uh, forest floor is what we're talking about here, primarily. So the forest floor we're talking about includes four principal layers. The litter, the fermentation layer of the litter, which is advanced decomposed, uh, litter beginning to decompose, you know, kind of sticks together, it's starting to, to lose its, its descriptive uh, uh, nature. Uh, underlain by the humus. Uh, humus is well decomposed organic matter mixed with mineral soil at about a 50-50 uh, or 50-50 basis. Uh, now, from the standpoint of the sampling that we've done in terms of what we see that's interesting in forest mineral soil horizons, uh, and you'll hear a lot more about mineral soils from other people, but the most interesting things that, that we find go on in the shallow mineral soil. That's mineral soil down to 30 centimeters of depth. And that can be broken apart into two different layers. Uh, the upper two inches or five centimeters of it is pretty well enriched by organic material that percolates down from the forest floor above. So it's rather unique in that it has relatively high content of organic matter as opposed to the rest of the, the mineral profile, which has very little. Scattered throughout again, advanced decomposed woody materials laying on, sometimes incorporated, even deeply incorporated uh, into these forest soils. Each has a function. And remember that all this put together is only a few inches deep in most of our soil. So it's very shallow. It's very easy to disturb. Uh, it's very easy to burn up uh, you know, with hot fires. It's, it's, it's very sensitive, shall we say. How is moisture distributed in this soil profile? Well, immediately you can see, and you can imagine, the decomposed wood in a soil profile holds a great deal of moisture. All organic materials hold a great deal of moisture. They have high pore volume. 
They tend to hold a lot of moisture as opposed to the mineral soil horizons. Available nitrogen. Again, the organic materials tend to hold most of the available nitrogen. Most of the available nitrogen that is there is derived from uh, decomposed organic matter. So that's where we would expect to find it. There's an additional factor that happens with decomposed wood that we'll get into later. But with respect to, in this case, nitrate, which is water soluble and available, uh, always highest in the wood. Ammonia, again, always highest in the wood. So these organic horizons, and specifically that wood, tends to be a very rich source of moisture and nitrogen. Some unique things happen with acidity, pH. A lot of forest soil microbes tend to enjoy, shall we, shall we say, relatively acid conditions. And by far and away, the most acid condition in most of our forest soils in this region, again, is soil wood. So it tends to have high resource value. It tends to have the right habitat situation for a lot of soil microbial activity. Age-wise, it takes a long time to get wood in the soil. These are just some simple carbon-14 dates that we ran. Uh, we made no attempt here to look for really old stuff. Uh, this was a relatively small sample, and we did find uh, material commonly in the soil over 500 years old. If we had specifically looked for old stuff, we probably would have found some in the age class of around 1,000 years, maybe even a little more, especially on stable soils, on relatively even slopes where you don't have down, down slope movement. So once it's in the soil, it tends to stay there. Another interesting thing about this stuff is there's certain species that tend to be much more persistent than the other. Uh, pines, larches, and especially Douglas fir decomposed by decomposed largely to what we call a brown rot system. Brown rotted wood tends to be extremely persistent in soils because it has a very high lignin content, which is very recalcitrant from the standpoint of decomposition. So it's, it's super persistent in soil. Uh, so when it comes to generating this stuff, not just any kind of wood will produce the kind of wood we'd like to have sometimes in our forest soils. It's sometimes species specific. We've had a look about what is it a little bit now in terms of its, its physical nature. Let's take a look at how it works. First of all, this is some older research uh, dating back to 1963. It was largely ignored for a very long period of time. This was a, a nursery type uh, work where they, they planted spruce in uh, various kinds of substrates and then measured how the roots grew within it. Now at that time, in 1963, there was a great deal of interest from the standpoint of reforestation in the fact that you had to have mineral soil to get regeneration. Because with a lot of species you do have to have mineral soil, but with a lot of species you don't. And uh, consequently, as I say, this, this work was largely overlooked. But by the time I get through showing you the next several slides, I think you'll see that these guys were right on the money. And it was basically overlooked for almost 20 years. Since this was a simulated experiment, uh, I, I think everybody assumed that this was not a natural situation and therefore didn't reflect what we'd find in nature. OK. To give you a feeling for how the organic horizons might affect growth, uh, what we've done here is just take spruce seedlings again. Uh, since since uh, uh, Day and Duffy use spruce, we'll just use spruce in this case to give you a feeling. Now, spruce is basically a, a climax species, of course. It does tend to grow in cool systems that have a lot of organic matter in it. You would expect it to be highly responsive to organic matter, and indeed it is. So with young spruce, you get a direct line relationship, very high correlation between organic matter depth and uh, growth in terms of seedling weight. Now, what I want to do is take a look at some microbial processes functionally. 
There's two processes that are very important, critical to the way trees grow. Mycorrhiza, because they tend to help provide moisture, phosphate, and uh, nitrogen to a substantial degree uh, to coniferous plants. It happens to be a rather unique kind of a situation where you have a symbiosis between a fungus and a tree where the tree normally grows in infertile situations. So this is sort of a hedge in its bet. It provides some carbohydrate in return. The fungus provides nutrients from the soil. And you'll, you'll hear a lot more about that in a presentation later. But needless to say, this is a very critical process from the standpoint of growth of, of most higher plants, but particularly conifers, and particularly conifers in infertile soils. Now, when we correlate the amount of mycorrhizal activity with the base productivity of a forest site, again, you see there's a very straight line relationship here. So this, this would confirm that you would expect that anything that would have this close a correlation between growth might be, have very critical function uh, in that system. Okay, now let's just take a look. We took a look at the total number uh, a little while ago uh, based on, or compared to uh, productivity potential. Now let's take a look at where they are in terms of those horizons. Uh, you can see that uh, they tend to be concentrated in the organic horizons. Now on the left in this particular slide, it shows you what the soil looks like. In other words, we took a sample here, and we, these were random samples. And so we just took a look at what the soil looks like. And on the right, we showed you where the mycorrhiza were in those soils. And basically what it says is this, is 95% of the mycorrhizal activity in this stand, and this is a mid-slope, Northern Rocky Mountain, subalpine fir uh, type ecosystem, 95% of the mycorrhiza during peak growth of that stand, which is in June and July, uh, occurred in organic horizons. And that's pretty telling. And we were surprised to see that. Uh, we expected it to be important. We didn't really expect it to be that important. And basically, we spent the next 20 years trying to shoot holes in this kind of a relationship, and we have not been able to. Uh, everything we've discovered since uh, indicates that these organic horizons are just extremely critical for these microbial processes that tend to drive growth. Let's track that through a season now. Uh, starting in the winter there, January, February, moving through again, the peak growth period, which is May, June, early July. Into the fall, things start to dry out, right? Cooling off then in the winter again. Uh, if you look at the portion that is supported by decomposed wood as you move from the moist season to the dry one, you see a trend, right? As you, as a drought, an onset of drought occurs in July and August, you see wood supporting a much greater portion of the mycorrhizal activity that occurs there. That suggests there might be something going on, right? So when we take a look at the dry season specifically and look across three different habitat types, the one on the right is quite a dry one. That's a Douglas fir ninebark in western Montana. You see it's extremely important to late season growth on those sites as determined by mycorrhiza. So this is the dry season of a dry site. So the moisture relationships here are extremely important to this process. Now let's look across a whole group of ecosystems, same basis. Take a look at where the mycorrhiza occur. As you go from left to right, you're going from very productive ecosystems, western white pine, subalpine fir, western hemlock, to some a little less so, uh, much more harsh types of, of ecosystems, Douglas fir, grand fir, ponderosa pine. Even in the very dry system, you find organic matter is probably driving the system. Look how important in the ponderosa pine site that 
first few centimeters of mineral soil, that's enriched by organic matter becomes. What's happening here, of course, is that it's so dry in these systems that even the organic matter is very dry very early in the seasons, uh, very early in the season. Then as you get, as rare though they may be, rainfall events during the course of the season, uh, there's not enough water to rewet them. So that water tends to percolate right through uh, the organic horizons and be deposited in the shallow mineral horizon, which then becomes uh, the hotbed of activity, as it were. But in any case, across all these ecosystems, you have the organic horizons really driving this process. Take a look at some disturbed ones now. Even in disturbed ecosystems, we find this is true. Uh, starting on the left, uh, mixed species, pole age stands, ponderosa pine, pole age stand, lodgepole pine, pole age stand, Douglas fir, pole age stand. These were disturbed, but not excessively so when they were reforested. Uh, we could tell by the, the soil samples that we took, and I'll take a little closer look at that later. They had been disturbed, but, but not destructively so. Now the two ecosystems on the right there, these are younger ones, they're 12 to 15 years old. One's lodgepole pine, one's western larch. Both of these were pretty substantially disturbed. The one on the far right was hammered. That was western larch. They were trying to regenerate western larch, and it's been known for a very long time that the only way to get western larch seed uh, to successfully germinate is with mineral soil, and they got it. This site was badly, uh, badly hurt. Uh, from the standpoint of long-term productivity because they virtually destroyed the organic horizon. And we'll take a little look at this later. You can get a, get a feeling for that. Now, let's take an, uh, another look at regeneration. This, this is regeneration under old growth. In other words, stuff that's beginning to come up as the old growth stand is breaking up. So they're competing with the old growth for available moisture. It's very dry in these systems. It's a real tough place for a seedling to make a living. And again, you can see the relative importance of wood goes up as you get to the dry system, and the importance of organic matter in general through all three, from the standpoint of supporting the root systems and the mycorrhizae on them. Now, the analytical look at those disturbed sites I was looking at earlier. Take a look at the bar on the left and get a feeling for the, the colored part, the colored section of the bar there. You can see it's what? It's maybe 12, 13, 14 percent height of that bar. Okay, this is a 52 year old lodgepole pine site. This is a poloid stand of lodgepole pine that we looked at earlier. The average soil bar is on the left, that's what the soil looks like, and on the right, that's where the mycorrhizae are. Same story, okay? This was site prepared, but it was not hammered. It was, you know, it wasn't wasn't stirred to the point that the, that the organic horizons had been utterly destroyed. This is a 16-year-old western larch site. Again, uh, you can see this was site prepared, and we we were losing some of that organic matter there on the left. It's down to oh, maybe 10%. But still, we have most of the mycorrhizae being supported in that horizon. This is lodgepole pine, and this is this is this one was was as the one larch stand we looked at early earlier. This was hammered. They really wanted to site prepare this site, and this this was considered good forestry 25 years ago, and they did get a lot of regeneration this way. What they didn't realize was it didn't do very well. You, you got good establishment, but it didn't do very well thereafter. In any case, you can see what's happened to the organic horizon. Despite that, you can see how important it was for the mycorrhiza for the stand that got started there. So it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with old growth stands or intermediate age stands or regeneration or site prepared. It doesn't seem to matter much what we do to these sites 
those organic horizons are extremely important to mycorrhizal activities, which in turn are critical for growth and survival. Now we took a look earlier at uh, what we might expect with spruce, looking at the growth, uh, the relationship between uh, organic matter and growth. Now I want to take a look at ponderosa pine. This is, this is a species that normally grows in very low organic matter environments. And now we're going to take a look at the mycorrhiza that occur only in the organic horizon. We're going to correlate that with growth, and we see we get a nice positive correlation. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing with the same seedlings and look at only the mycorrhizae that occurred in the mineral soil. We get a nice negative relationship. So that gives you a pretty good feeling for how important the organic matter is to provide the things that the mycorrhizae in turn provide to the tree. In the absence of that of organic horizon, we get a strong negative relationship. It does take a fair amount of, of carbohydrate produced by the tree, a fair amount of food stuff provided by that tree to support those mycorrhiza. And if they're not returning something in kind pretty prolifically, it's kind of uh, like a wasted energy. So you can have very strong negative relationships between growth and mycorrhiza if the soil doesn't have what it needs for the mycorrhizae to do their thing appropriately. Let's take a look at another process now. There's two ways, three ways you can get nitrogen into a forest soil. One of them is through air pollution or uh, rainfall. Uh, in some cases, like most of the northern Rockies, most of this country, you don't get very much that way. On the other hand, in eastern forests, they get more nitrogen than they can stand uh, because of air pollution and rainfall input. But we don't here. Okay, so that's one source. Relatively low on here. Quite low on here, actually. Uh, now, there's two microbial-based processes that also input nitrogen. One of them is symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and that is nodulated plants that have bacteria in the roots that fix nitrogen, and they do that with energy supplied by the plant, like alfalfa, okay? We have a whole, whole group of those that occur in forest ecosystems. Unfortunately, we don't find very many of them very often in most of our ecosystems. The other process is what, through non-symbiotic nitrogen fixation, which is free-living bacteria, which is what we're looking at here, free-living nitrogen fix fixers that are using energy from the organic matter in the soil to fix nitrogen. Okay, so they just occur in the soil. They're scarfing up basically energy materials leaking from the soil, uh, from the decomposition uh, of soil organic horizons to fix nitrogen. In most cases, we largely depend on this process in most of the inland northwestern soil. And this is the same type of a correlation we drew with mycorrhiza earlier. We're just correlating the amount of activity to yield capacity of the site. Very nice, strong, straight line correlation. Again, if we look at where it occurs, we also get a similar thing. But now the bar on the far right is a little different kind of a bar than I showed you earlier. This is a decayed log not in the soil, but laying suspended on the soil. You know the one uh, it's laying there, it has some shelf fungi, you know, some, it's in a fairly advanced stage of decomposition. You could probably walk up with your boot and fetch it a kick and kick a big piece out of it and wouldn't break your toe. That is a veritable nitrogen sponge compared to most other situations in that soil. Very high. It's really uh, what we refer to as a nitrogen pump. Okay, another set of bars getting at the same sort of thing we did with earlier with mycorrhiza. We're going from a moist to a dry ecosystem. In a dry ecosystem, again, you see the increasing importance of wood. This happens to be wood in the soil rather than on the soil. Same type of thing we looked at with mycorrhiza. 
So these two critical processes that really drive growth and survival of trees uh, in these soils behaving exactly the same way with regard to the various types of organic components that are in those soils. Now this will give you a feeling for where nitrogen is stored and where the fixation capacity would be uh, if you would remove it. And of course you see that the both are again concentrated in these organic horizons. Douglas fir site, first set of bars on the left, that's where it's stored. Second set of bars, that's where it's fixed. Okay, third set of bars, that's a western hemlock site, that's where it's stored. And the second sort of bars, where it's fixed. So storage and fixation are occurring in very much the same places. Relative effectiveness of the two processes. Okay. If we have symbiotic plants on the site in sufficient numbers that they're doing their thing, they can pump a great deal more nitrogen than non-symbiotic sources or aerosol inputs, rainfall inputs. So when you have plants like Ceanothus and Alder, they can really put a lot of nitrogen in the system compared to any other way of getting it there, other than physically putting it there, fertilizing. So you can see uh, with the alder there, that's the red bar on the far right, that would be an 80 to 100% canopy coverage of alder. That's 100 times more effective than all of the components uh, that could be put together from non-symbiotic. Okay, And with uh, the uh, Ceanothus there, that's had about a 25% canopy coverage. So it's five times more effective. But most of the time we simply don't have it. This is some data from the habitat type books. And what you have here is two different types of climax types, two different habitat types, Douglas fir and Grand fir. And what we have, if you start with the first one under alder there, allness, out of 755 stands sampled in Douglas fir, okay, one of them had some alder on it. These are mid-slope 70 plus year old stands that they use for habitat typing. So on that basis, in the Grand Fir series, the best situation we had was 17 of 114 stands sampled had Ceanothus on them. The other thing that's unfortunate when we take a look at this is the canopy coverages are very poor. So they don't tend to occur often and they don't tend to occur in very heavy numbers. So they're not very dependable as a source of nitrogen. In Douglas fir we found lupin, 755 stands, only 25 of them had, 29 of them had lupin in them. This sort of gives you a feeling of, of even though this is the process we might like to have, uh, on the site, and it, it is, would be very effective, a lot of times we don't have it. And historically, a lot of times when we did have it, we fought it because it was seen as competition. Okay, now let's take a look at how it works, or excuse me, how to treat it. See if we can get some feeling for how we might manage and what the repercussions might be if we didn't. This is using mycorrhiza as a bioindicator of how much organic matter we might like to see. The series of green bar bars in the back there are a wet system, a series of red bars are a dry system. And what we're doing is stepping through organic matter content starting at 15, 30, 45, and 45 plus percent of the top 12 inches of soil. And what you see is, is the, uh, the green set and the yellow set definitely peak and drop off. In fact, the red one didn't, uh, even though that, uh, that last bar, is uh, the 45 plus bar is a little lower than the 45 bar, statistically it wasn't significant because it occurred so rarely. But in any case, 
we have used this as a basis for saying that at least we're driving the mycorrhizal process is concerned that if we could shoot for managing at least as much as gave us that peak in activity, we could say that at least with this process, we're probably leaving enough on the site to provide for adequate mycorrhizal activity. And it turns out after a, a bunch of mechanical calculations to figure out what it takes to do that, uh, that turned out to be about 10 to 15 tons per acre, which isn't a great deal. So for many years, we based our a recommendation for most of the inland northwest as 10 to 15 tons per acre of relatively large woody residue post-harvest with a minimum of soil disturbance and, 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 and destruction of what was there before we went in as something that we felt was a pretty good target and that we could scientifically justify. And we've done some follow-up on this work. Russ Graham just completed the publication uh, where we have had field crews out for a number of years looking at a wide variety of ecosystems and taking a look at the same type of thing. And this shows you the range of variation they found. Uh, this goes everywhere from the southwest to, to the almost the Pacific Northwest. And if you look at the two vertical blue bars there, that's the 10 to 15 ton I was talking about earlier there. So you can see that, that uh, we came out in pretty much the same ballpark with a couple exceptions. The western hemlock quintonia, old growth systems tended to have a lot more. The Grand Fur Acer tended to have a lot less. Most of the rest fell pretty much in that same range. Uh, our National Forest people were really interested in having a habitat type by habitat type look at this. And so that's what this was designed to do. But the 10 to 15 ton still looks pretty good. And what we generally say now is if you take the 10 to 15 tons as your minimum, maybe try to produce a bit more than that, recognizing that if you get too much, you create a fire hazard. And if you get too much fuel on the ground and you get a fire in it at the wrong time, it's extremely dangerous. And I'll take a look at that too. Our fire people tell us about 60 tons per acre is where you start getting to the point that you really are creating a fire hazard. So this sort of gives you a broad scope of, of what one might want to do in terms of, of, of managing soil organic matter and the parent materials that create it. I think you can be, you can use a fairly, fairly wide base of variation. But one thing you can say, I think, is you can't expect real dry ecosystems that don't accumulate or that shouldn't accumulate large volumes of woody materials and organic uh, horizons uh, to produce high volumes. So you don't, you don't try to make a ponderosa pine site look like a western hemlock site. I think that probably would be self-defeating. Uh, in fact, one of the problems that we have with, with this data right now is, of course, these are these happen to be old growth systems. And using old growth as sort of the control, uh, unfortunately, right now, most of our old growth systems are a bit heavy in the organic matters and fuels. So you have to kind of bear that in mind, that these, most of these are fuel laden right now and probably should not be. But it does give you sort of a, a feeling for what you might do in terms of this sort of thing. Now. If we start playing around with a system in terms of, for example, site preparation, what are the ramifications? And this goes through the ramifications of what might happen with respect to nitrogen. This is so-called mineralizable nitrogen, which is combined ammonium and nitrate. And if you look in the mineral soil, uh, and we have no disturbance, moderate scarification, 
no scarification, real heavy scarification. Okay, somewhat like the site of the lodgepole pine in Western Larch I showed you earlier. Look what happens with the organic horizon and what happens with the, we can get an 80% loss of the soil nitrogen stores in that system. And soil and nitrogen is an absolute requirement for growth. So overzealous site preparation is not a very good idea. Same situation with fire. Undisturbed, severe burn, no burn, slight burn, extreme burn. Now this extreme burn is really hot. This is hot enough to change color of the soil. Okay. Even a severe burn, you get 90%, more than 90% loss of nitrogen. So heavy fuel on the ground type wildfires are extremely dangerous from the standpoint of nitrogen and long-term productivity. Devastating. Ramifications. Now this. I think this, this slide really tells the story. In the uh, blue-green there is storage capacity, and we took a look at that at one of the slides earlier. Okay. On the white is the fixation capacity. All right. Now if we say that we lost virtually all of the nitrogen in this system that was stored in the organic horizons, okay? That's 1,468 kilograms lost. Then we say, with the fixation capacity that we have left, how long would it take to get that system back in production? Well, for the calculation I made there, I made a, an assumption. We had some CNOFIS. Okay, maybe 10, 12% canopy coverage. We add up scattering a little bit of CNOFIS in this system. We add up the fixation capacity, see how long it takes? Well, it takes 108 years get that system back to where it was before. Now, if we didn't have the CNOFIS, it would take three, four, maybe five times. Okay, that's spooky. So I think it does one well to take care of the organic horizons and the nitrogen and mycorrhizae that they support. Or you're very likely to impair long-term productivity. And unfortunately, we have discovered that getting nitrogen back into that system is not as simple as just taking it back in there and throwing it on in terms of fertilizing. That doesn't seem to work very well with many of our ecosystems, perhaps most of them uh, in, in the Northwest. Uh, this works only in small amounts. And uh, because you, when you start, for some reason, Artificially applied nitrogen changes the physiology of the trees and makes them do things that they ordinarily wouldn't do. It sends bad signals to the system that, number one, can controls top growth to bottom growth. If you start putting a lot of nitrogen on the soil, the plants think they have it good. So they start building big tops and they don't build a root system to support it. I guess because they physiologically I don't think they need to. They also tend to lose some of the phenolic compounds. They don't produce some of the phenolic compounds that are very important for defense. So they tend to become stressed. They lose some of their defensive capability and they become highly susceptible to a number of insects and diseases. So balancing this system artificially is very, looks like it's going to be a very difficult thing. So it's best to keep them as natural as you can. I guess you could summarize what to do very easily. It's not so easily accomplished, uh, obviously. Uh, erosion takes all that stuff out of the system. Compaction renders it unworkable. Outright loss, uh, 
again, is a problem. Even if you mix it in the soil, like plowing it in, instead of having horizons, you change the whole ecology of the system. Uh, wood does not act like wood unless it comes in large chunks. As a large chunk, it becomes what we refer to as a perched water table. It's like uh, sitting, sitting there, a, a large chunk of water being held uh, in, a, in an environment that has a particular uh, acid uh, uh, base. It's, 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 it's a, a situation that, that coincidentally, uh, conifer tree roots seem to like. This, uh, and, and non-conifers don't. Yeah, that's, that's another interesting thing I might mention. If you go out and take a look at the root systems that occur in old decomposing wood in forest soils, you'll find a lot of conifer roots, very few herbaceous roots. So apparently that acid high phenolic lignin matrix that is old wood, um, conifers have learned how to deal with. And uh, certain microbes have learned how to deal with and many others have not. So it, it is a very unique and very important substrate in forest soils. And then always to remember that in dealing with the forest floor, these organic horizons, they are very shallow and highly subject to damage. 35, 30 years ago, we were doing, I think, in forestry, a very poor job of managing forest soil horizons. I think for the last 10 or 15 years, we've been doing a fairly good job in most cases. And you will see, I think, in most of the inland Northwest that uh, most forest harvest operations in most forest districts that I'm familiar with are doing a pretty respectable job these days. There are still some that uh, are not very sensitized to this sort of thing, but not many. Uh, we've come a long way in, in forest soil management, uh, particularly in the last 10 years. I think that's the size of what I've got here, other than to perhaps drive home some points. I don't see much of this kind of forestry anymore. I don't like to see this kind of forestry. If you come back 25 years later, what you'll find is large trees growing around the edges of that windrow. Small trees growing everywhere else. And they did that with the cat. And of course it was for good reason. Uh, this happens to be east side Rocky Mountains and they have a lot of problems with excess fuel accumulation and it's very difficult to deal with. There's too much there to broadcast burn because it's a problem keeping control of it. So they try to windrow it. If, it's, if they do a really good job of windrowing it, they've done a real poor job of forestry. They're getting a lot better, I think, now about doing a lousy job of wind growing it, leaving a lot of stuff scattered around, burning only what they have to burn to get that fuel level down. Again, I just came back from a pretty extensive trip in Canada, and I see in a lot of the provincial forests they haven't got the message up there yet. Uh, in southern BC, they're doing a pretty good job. In northern BC, see an awful lot of this kind of thing yet. This is an example of what was done 35 years ago in the Bitterroot Mountains. I don't know if any of you remember the brouhaha from, from there. What it amounted to is in Idaho Bathwood country, they discovered that uh, terracing worked very, very well under some circumstances to grow ponderosa pine. So they tried to transfer the method to some, some other kinds of soils. If you look really closely in that slide, and I don't think you can see it electronically, you can see a very small, tiny green spots in the middle 
of those terraces. And that was Douglas fir. They tried to use Douglas fir in, well, as I say, uh, uh, a different soil. And you can see that uh, where they didn't site prepare the forest is doing a great deal better. And of course, Douglas fir happens to be a species that's highly sensitive to organic matter. Uh, Ponderosa pine, perhaps a little bit less so. But uh, it was a really bad idea. It sounded good at the time, and it's experience. And this sort of thing, uh, this is one of Jim Brown's shots of the Yellowstone fire. Uh, when we get really hot fires, they really can do a lot of damage. And one of our problems in dealing with the issue of forest health right now is to defuel some of the, our highly sensitive ecosystem. And I think it's something that's a real good idea if it's appropriately done. Of course, it could be inappropriately done, but if it's appropriately done, I think it's a real good idea. Um, a lot of these fires are doing a lot of damage because a lot of them now have a tremendous amount of fuels down large fuels down on the ground. So you get high temperatures, high retention times, and a lot of damage. And I think that pretty much sums it up. I'd be glad to take questions. Yep. When the logs are on the ground and burn and get a uh, carbon surface, do they behave the same as the yes. logs that uh, don't have that surface? Yes. Um, that's something we've considered quite a lot. What we've discovered is that uh, it only takes a year or two for them to check deeply to give access to a large number of fungi that ordinarily would be there. Also, there's a number of fungi that seem to get along very well with wood in a highly charred condition. It's a very unique habitat type or habitat situation. And there do, it does seem to be a number of fungi that are able to tolerate that, that charring layer very easily. So we don't see charring as being something that uh, significantly reduces the function of, of wood. Uh, and prescribed burning, uh, address uh, fall burning versus spring burning from a soil standpoint. Of course, fall burning carries with it considerably higher risk. Uh, because you're burning, burning with the organic horizons much drier. Uh, I don't see any particular problem with it as long as that, uh, that uh, duff and organic horizon layers have sufficient moisture in them that they don't burn deeply. But it is, of course, much more difficult. And then the problem in the, far, in the spring is to get them to burn at all, of course. But, uh, yeah, it... Uh, Prescribed burning and, and even under burning and a lot of the things that, that we're probably going to have to implement uh, to, for example, to, to defuel some of our heavy, heavily fueled uh, systems right now is going to be touchy. And, but one thing we know is if, if we don't do something, when they burn, it's very likely to be at the very worst time. So even, even if by trying to do, head this off, even if we cause a fair amount of damage, we're probably not going to cause near as much damage as if we just let nature take its course at this point. But it is more difficult in the fall and the spring. There's no doubt about it. Let's go to some of the remote sites now. If uh, our control rooms accept the, the numbers that people can call, uh, that would be helpful. And then let's go ahead and receive calls from the remote sites and see how many people are really out there. It's difficult, I know, but it's, it's you know it's kind of like your first kiss. Once you do it, it's easy. <laughs> Anybody from the remote sites? Oh, Anybody? It's quiet. You got one coming in? No. Okay. Another question from a grand. Okay, go ahead. This is in, in Baker City. Uh, I'm wondering what the uh, trade-off is with removing organic matter, the woody material, uh, versus leaving it on the ground and doing an underburning, and how this uh, relates to uh, logging. 
logging to remove the fuels versus underburning to remove the fuels. I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're driving at. I don't see a problem with either way, uh, actually. Uh, underburning in a condition where you're not likely to get too much damage may not be very effective. It may be very difficult to, to defuel a system under the kind of environmental conditions uh, that would not would prevent it from getting too hot. In, in some respects, I think we're going to be going to find logging the system appropriately uh, might be the less damaging alternative. Uh, but in a lot of systems, of course, economically, it would be very, very difficult to do that because it most certainly would be a deficit sale situation because in most cases what we have in these kinds of ecosystems is very poor value volume. So we need to be doing something in terms of perhaps even subsidizing uh, the removal of that sort of thing to get that fuel, that carbon, out of the system without burning it off. Uh, this is, this, there are some very difficult uh, uh, questions to be resolved uh, with respect to, to managing this excess fuel we now have in many, especially of our drier ecosystems. Okay? If, if, I didn't, if I didn't get to what you want, I come back again and, and, and I'll try again. That, that was a good answer. Um, the only question that remains is, uh, is it, might, might it not be cheaper to do staged underburning than to do the deficit type of uh, removal? Yeah, I'm sure it would be cheaper. Uh, at least in the short term. Uh, but we're probably going to have a substantial learning curve uh, with regard to how to do that. It's, it's going to be very risky uh, to do that. And whether or not it can be reliably done without doing uh, a lot of associated damage uh, remains to be seen. It's going to be a very, very interesting thing to, to see develop. Uh, I think it's no doubt that, that uh, uh, at least from a, a small area point of view, it would be cheaper to burn it. From a larger uh, system, it may not be. Uh, fire control is not cheap. And uh, when you're trying to, to burn large forested areas, uh, just managing the fire control operation to keep that thing in check might be as expensive, perhaps even more expensive, than the harvest alternative. Uh, so it remains to be seen how, how the gives and takes of that situation will work out. Other questions from remote site? Is there anybody out what? there? <laughs> <laughs> Any more from LeGrand while we're waiting? Uh, is there reliable information on what the fuel on the forest floors were in the Intermountain region prior to Europeans? And I guess the other question with, does the standing trees, when they burn, do they have a much effect on the soil temperatures, or is your primary concern the downed wood? The primary concern with respect to heating the soil is the downed wood. The standing trees, the heat all goes up, and they're very, very well insulated. Uh, you know, the soil is pretty well insulated below, especially if it has a fair amount of moisture in it anyway. So that type of fire, I don't think, does do a lot of damage. It's when you get a lot of the big fuels down uh, close to the soil that it becomes quite damaging. Did I get to both questions there? I'm right, not sure and the other both. question was, is there reliable information on what typical down fuel loads were uh, prior to Europeans in the Intermountain West, in the forest? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, we have very few places to look where uh, fire histories are normal. There are some, there are a few, uh, where fire history remains, as best we can figure, somewhat within historical variance. But uh, I would say a lot of our information is skewed 
uh, by uh, uh, fuel accumulations. We don't know just how much yet. Uh, that's something we're going to have to take a, a very critical look at, and really haven't yet. Other questions? Yeah. What role do you feel that uh, grasses have in uh, uh, nutrient recycling uh, as far as adding nitrates? I know they have a tremendous root system, which uh, dies. Every, some of it dies every year, and it decomposes in the soil. Uh, I know I've heard a lot of pros and cons about planting grass in, in with your trees. And what's your feeling on that? I think native grasses and sedge probably have a, a, a fairly significant uh, function. Uh, yes, uh, the roots on grasses do tend to grow and die at a very high rate. They do on trees too. Uh, the root turnover process in trees is also pretty high, surprisingly high. Uh, as to how this would balance itself out in any particular system, as far as the, the, the benefits or lack thereof of certain grasses, I couldn't tell you. Um, we do know that the, the grasses can be serious competition uh, for most of our woody plants, but uh, if we're looking at a balanced system and not just looking for timber volume growth, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And obviously, uh, if we're dealing with wildlife situations, it's also not a, a bad thing. But just how this balances out, there has been relatively small amount of work done with the interactions between the overstory of trees and the understory canopies of various layers, grass or shrub. Uh, this work is only just begun seriously four or five years ago, and there's just beginning to be some stuff appear in the literature now. I think you can expect to see some, some fairly significant uh, advancements in that area over the next four or five years. But right now, uh, I think that would be very difficult to, to really address in depth. Other questions from the remote sites? Come on, folks. Wake up out there. Yeah, Could I got a question. Bert. Go ahead. Um, after fires, um, Forest Service has a tendency to use things like cereal rye um, because it comes in fairly quickly and supposedly doesn't last that long. It doesn't create much competition. Do you believe this, or um, should we be using something else uh, instead of the cereal rye? Oh, that's a good question, and I'm really not in a position to answer that. Um, I guess my feeling, the literature I've seen is, is that uh, a, a lot of the quote-unquote non-natives that have been used for stabilization have uh, had only limited effectiveness. And despite the fact that we expect them to see them rapidly die out, sometimes they don't and uh, then they continue to cause problems thereafter. Uh, using that type of grass as a stabilization, again, you know, you're balancing the pros and cons. If you're lurking in landscapes that are highly erodible, you know you're going to have a serious problem on, I don't think it's inappropriate to try. Uh, I think a lot of times we tend to, to, to use these kind of treatments uh, pretty much broad brush and, and I think it would not be appropriate, for example, uh, to do slope stabilization with non-natives in an area where the slopes or where the, the soils are fairly stable anyway. And a lot of times, you know, really doing a lot of balancing of pros and cons. The same is true in, in dealing with competition, uh, dealing with grazing pressure, uh, a, a lot of things. You're trying to grow a forest is a real balancing process. And you're some, most of the time, I think you're going to be relatively right. You're probably always going to have the right reason, but you might very often get the wrong result. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing in forestry that we have not come to grips with very well in society, and that is the relative risk of what we do. Uh, outcomes uh, in such complex systems are marginally predicted. Other questions? Go ahead. I was walk 
I was walking through a clear cut uh, that had been burned after it had been cut. And I noticed uh, in patches that where the flames hadn't seared the ground, that it was regenerating with alder and, and uh, small trees. But in the places that had been burned, there's nothing there except maybe a little thistle. Uh, has there been much study on the difference in regeneration on the p places that have been burned and the ones that haven't? Yes. Uh, there has been a fair amount of research done in that, and it all depends on what species you're talking about. Uh, for example, if you had been in a western larch-dominated uh, ecosystem in northwestern Montana, you would have found most of the regeneration in the burn spots and very little in the non-burn spots. So it all depends on the system you're working with. And the nice thing about the broadcast burns is they create a mosaic of conditions. So you have everything from a relatively harsh burn to no burn at all. And especially in mixed, where you want a mixed species situation to come in there, if you get that kind of a mosaic, then somewhere in the system, you'll have the exact requirement for each of the species that you might want to get there. So you have the best chance of, of getting mixed representation in the regenerating stand. Can you, can you burn deliberately? Can you find your burn so that it would, that will happen? Yes. And, and largely broadcast burns are designed to, to do that very thing, is to create a, a mosaic in conditions. And we have recommended for quite some time that with mechanical site preparation, scarifications and the like, that they do the same thing. That they try to come out, come out, come with an outcome that gives a full range uh, of situations from undisturbed to heavily disturbed but not to have very much of that heavily disturbed, as, as we saw, that, that if it's widespread, can be devastating. Okay. Other questions from the remote side? I have sites? another question from Bern. Go ahead. Um, can uh, ground-based, uh, like tractor systems, have uh, logging systems have an effect on the introduction of uh, pathogens to forested sites? Okay. Um, to my knowledge, at this point, um, we don't have many instances where that's true. We do have some. Uh, some of the pythiaceous uh, fungi, uh, water mold fungi, like uh, oh, uh, cedar. Uh, can't think of the of the particular pathogen on the west coast that is is very dangerous to cedar. It can be transported very easily. Uh, so there are a few pathogens where that can be an important process. Most of our native pathogens are present in most of our sites most of the time. They're endemic to the system. So moving them around is no big deal. What really creates the problem with most endemic pathogens is inappropriate stand conditions, uh, inappropriate uh, species, inappropriate densities, uh, excessive competition, uh, stress. Most of our pathogens tend to be most active in circumstances where the forest is in a condition that's inappropriate. So it becomes a symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. Does that make sense? <laughs> Is anybody at Prineville tonight? You're awfully quiet over there. Yes, we're here. Okay, any questions? Any questions from Prineville? Yeah, I have a question um, regarding the difference between spring and fall burning. When you consider that these systems do not evolve under spring burning and all the arthropods and the wildlife, the ground nesting birds, have you evaluated the amount of damage you do by spring burning and to, to plants that grow in the spring and set seed in the spring, the real early plants, when you burn them? No, uh, in a word. Uh, there's been very little research at this point on spring burning. Uh, there is some going on now. For you, uh, let loose of the and for the last four or five years, but very little has actually come out of that research 
at this point yet, and there isn't much been hasn't much been done on functional nature uh, of that sort of thing. Uh, interestingly enough, I had the privilege of being in Siberia a year ago, and they have a little bit of work that uh, is published where they used various kinds of burning at various fuel levels. Uh, the type of thing we've done here, only they did some very uh, detailed uh, microbial uh, functional work over there. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have that material uh, yet interpreted. Uh, so we don't have anything from them yet uh, that, uh, that I could pass along to you. But uh, we are at this moment trying to get that uh, uh, converted to English so that uh, we can see what it is that they were able to do. Twenty years ago, the, uh, the Russians were, were very, had very active uh, uh, people in Siberia. They were doing a lot of research uh, during a time when they uh, were doing fairly well economically. Unfortunately, they're not doing as much today. And even getting uh, this material transcribed is becoming very difficult. But uh, they did do some, some good work. And uh, I'm hoping to get my hands on that, that material fairly soon. So I can't give you very much uh, specific information. I think, again, we can expect to start to see that to come. But uh, there isn't much in the literature at this point, at least not much that I'm aware of. OK, we haven't heard anything from halfway or uh the Dalles, Ontario. I know it's long distance from Walla Walla, but you can still call. <laughs> Another question from Pineville. Go ahead. This is not really a soil question, but more of a juniper question. I'm wondering if there are any path pathogens that can lower the juniper population or any other <laughs> sorts of biological control. Yeah, I know there's a number of different places where we're having problems with junipers. Uh, we know very little about the pathology of the juniperaceae. Uh, it's a very understudied species. Um, obviously, before the last 10 years or so, there's been very little interest in it, and so very little uh, in the way of money to fund research on it. Uh, again, I think you'll see that start to change, uh, because we have some obvious things going on with uh, the distribution and uh, condition of juniper stands throughout the West, and especially some, some in the Southwest. And at this point, the reasons for a great deal of that are still a great mystery. And whether or not any of it could be microbial based, uh, I have no idea at this point. I have heard no rumors to the effect that, that anybody has discovered any microbial uh, things going on in some of those, those changing juniper ecosystems. Anybody else? Questions? Enterprise has been awfully quiet too tonight. I know Leo must be up there. How about here in, in our local audience? Any questions, Ben? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question that I really don't know the answer to. Let me, let me give you this much of the information of what we know in stands of forest okay. trees. Question. Just hold off for a minute, please. Uh, we find very little problem with nutrient deficiencies in young trees because you do tend to have a relatively a high amount of nutrient for a very low demand because the little small trees make a very low demand. Once the stand closes, apparently what nitrogen is in the system in terms of in the trees at that time is pretty much all they ever get. So the growth process from that point on comes primarily from internally cycled nitrogen. So if that helps you any to understand that relationship, I can't answer it directly, only, only indirectly. 
uh, in most cases I know of where they do nutritional work. They do the nutritional work in terms of analyzing leaves, for example. How much should a leaf have before it uh, begins to show indication of the tree showing the nutrient deficiency. They seem to be able to use seedling work uh, and apply it to larger trees. Uh, it's, it's done. I, I don't know if, if, if there's a problem with doing that. I've not heard of a problem in doing that or not. But uh, that's the way it's done. That's how they determine whether or not a large tree is, is having a nutrient problem. Is they, they take some needles off it, run it through analysis, find out what the nutrient content is. If it's up to an uh, inappropriate amount, which they've determined with seedlings, that it takes uh, for the tree to grow without symptoms, uh, then they assume that it's, it's enough. I'm ecstatic that we have another question from a remote site. Go ahead on it. Hmm. I think the question was, could you repeat the question in the last question? Oh. I have a question. <laughs> um, mycorrhizal fungi, I understand, sometimes are antagonistic to other mycorrhizal fungi. In other words, there are uh, plant associations like... Uh, uh, certain associations of, of grasses with pine will uh, be, ha have mycorrhizal fungi associated with them that are not antagonistic to the pine. What does the uh, what kind of antagonism might there be from non-native uh, grasses or forbs that might be introduced? That's another good question that I can't answer. Uh, to my knowledge, there has not been any work done on that yet. However, we do know uh, that there are some problems uh, with respect to competitive relations between plants in terms of competition factors, either from the microbial community in the soils or from changes in the soil brought about by another kind of a plant which is detrimental to, to mycorrhiza or other microbial uh, support of conifer roots. So I think you can assume that there probably is some of that kind of thing going on. But uh, at this point, we don't know very much about it. We do know that, for example, that, that some uh, shrub species uh, are really good nurse plants for, for some kinds of mycorrhiza for conifers. Uh, I think that we have some situations where we have other kinds of plants which we know are very negative. So there's a whole array of interactions between plants that occurs below grounds that we know very little about, really. It's a very difficult and expensive area of research. And as a result, it's something that we're, we're finding things out about slowly. Okay. Let's go to our local uh, audience, and Lynn has a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that there was a problem with removing excess fuel at times and also a problem with uh, leaving it in place that it might burn too hot. Is chipping that material uh, an option, either removing it as chip material or spreading it on site? Okay, that's a good question. I can give you some answers on that. Could, could the remote sites hear that question? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. We've tried a number of ways of dealing with with chipping. One of them that's been tried is chipping and just putting them back on site, essentially evenly. Now, interestingly enough, this was done at 10,000 feet in Wyoming. And two things happened. Number one, the first couple years, rainfall events in those chips, leaches, large amounts of phenolic, water soluble phenolics. They're very toxic to most living things. So when they interplanted in those chips, all the seedlings died. Not only that, if you went back to that site in August and dug down four inches, you had ice block soils. So during the winter time, when it was 20 below zero and it froze them down to a foot or two or three, 
Come spring, it was like having a layer of styrofoam over the soil. And it turned out to be a real poor idea. Uh, now, a year ago, we finally got a chance to try this again. And we are doing some research right now uh, on the University of California's forest near Blodgett, California, on putting this stuff back on the site instead of spreading it on the site. We're creating what we'd call artificial logs on that site, covering less than 25% of the area and creating piles large enough that we think we'll get permanent deposits of organics very similar to what you would get with advanced decomposed wood. How that turns out remains to be seen, but I think it'll probably turn out well. So there are some scenarios that you could devise where I think we could do this. Whether or not it's economic from the standpoint of the energy it requires to chip, that's a different story. But theoretically, whether this can be done, I think we, we do need to answer that. So How large are your chips? How large are the chips? These are relatively large chips. And we're trying it in this particular situation because those are warm, moist forests. We expect ch the chip decomposition to happen very fast. So I think we can probably get 100 years worth of experiment in the Northwest in 10 years mm -hmm. down there. So we, we hope that, that we can do that and see what the outcome is. That's not providing a lot of answers, but it's providing some information. Another question from LeGrand. Shoot. I believe it was one of your slides showed that a lot of the nitrogen in the forest floor was held in the big logs. It, it seems to indicate that maybe there, we're taking off a lot of nitrogen when we harvest a tree. No, that's actually not true. When you harvest a tree, a tree trunk has very little nitrogen in it. And the reason why is because the tree does not store nitrogen there. It stores nitrogen in the small twigs and leaves. So if you leave the small twigs, leaves, and roots, you leave most of the nitrogen that your tree held there. Now what happens when you take a piece of a tree trunk and lay it on the ground and get it to decompose is as it decomposes, you get these, these free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria in there. They pull the nitrogen in. So it's not nitrogen that came there. It's nitrogen that's being pulled into that site. So it's really quite a, quite a, a, a different scenario there. So the log, uh, as a fresh log, does not have very much nitrogen in it. But as one that's in the act of decomposing, especially the older it gets, the more nitrogen you get until you get conifer roots coming in there. As soon as the conifer roots come in there, then they start transporting it out. Other questions from remote sites? Yeah, I've got one uh, from Pineville. Uh, given that the reduction of the organic matter isn't a good idea, what's the preferred method of site prep? Light. Mm -hmm. Recognize that you do have to do some site preparation. Uh, you don't have to do an overzealous job of it. And I also showed you some slides there that showed you that modest mechanical disruption was not a problem. In fact, light mechanical disruption, if anything, could enhance your nitrogen situation. It's only when that, that disturbance gets to be heavy-handed that it gets to be a problem. Yeah, can you distinguish between light and heavy? <laughs> uh, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's arbitrary, but uh, I'd say uh, if you're disturbing more than 50%, of the surface area, you're starting to get into an area where you're getting heavy-handed. If you're doing disturbing 75% of it, you most assuredly are being heavy-handed. Something below that is fairly moderate. Yeah, you, you, know, you get into the same problem when you start describing fire. Okay, what's hot and what's not? Uh, 
we can say that when you start getting above 400 degrees temperature, you start volatilizing a very large portion of the nitrogen. But what's it take to give you 400 degrees? Well, as best we can figure, it's a flame length in excess of four feet. But these are all very subjective kinds of things. Uh, like I say, I think we recognize that we do have to do some burning. We recognize that we do have to do some mechanical site preparation. I think we can also recognize that we have to do it with as light a hand as we can and achieve the objective that you must achieve to get the forest restarted. Again, it's, it's, it's a whole lineup of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And I would err to the light side rather than err to the heavy side. More questions from remote sites? I have another question from Prineville. Um, regarding soil compaction, a lot of the areas in a number of the forests that have heavy fuel loading. The heavy fuel loading is due to previous logging slash. And a lot of those areas are already exceeding compaction levels, some as high as 30, 40 to 50 percent. So how do you suggest going in there and removing some of those fuels without permanently destroying the soil? We're going to have some situations where the best fix is not a great one uh, because of the situation we're already in. Uh, in a case like that, again, I would say, uh, if you're in grave danger of having very heavy wildfires in there, what's going to happen is you're going to have a very heavy wildfire and compacted soils. So I think doing some pre-fire management in terms of doing something to moderate that fuel is not inappropriate, even if it might cost you some additional compaction. Again, it's a matter of trade-off. And it's very difficult to say just where that trade-off would be unless you're standing on the site looking at it. Basically, what you're talking there is restructuring a soil. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. And I guess the real bottom line to the, the messages that I've always tried to, to produce with respect to soil and soil organic matter management and compaction and that sort of thing is prevention is sure by far and away the best way to go because once you've caused the problem, bringing them back online is, is very difficult. But recognize also that uh, natural processes weren't too kind either. Mm -hmm. And a lot of natural wildfires, a lot of our ecosystems do tend to burn with hot, hot fires. Infrequent, real hot fires. I think that's an example of where influence of human hands could actually increase productivity of some of our forest sites, in some cases considerably because we do have the option of using a little less drastic systems to regulate carbon in these sites than Mother Nature has. And some of our, our uh, relatively long fire cycle grand fir forests are an example. Certainly east side Rocky Mountain. Subalpine fir lodgepole pine forests are an example. Where a managed forest could well have higher productivity than natural forests. Go ahead. Considering uh, how much uh, just the nutrients that you've been talking about uh, are tied in with the organic cycle and probably the other 14 or 15 or so essential nutrients that are also being cycled in the organic cycle, uh, do you want to even touch the thing about you know removal versus burning as it might affect some of those sure. other 15? Oh, sure. Uh, actually, nitrogen and sulfur are the two nutrients that are most closely tied to organics. Most of the rest aren't too closely tied to organics. And it's relatively uncommon that we find real micronutrient deficiencies in forest sites. There are a few. 
but that's the exception more than the rule. And in most cases where it's been investigated, uh, if you don't take hide, hair, feathers, and all, <laughs> if you take just bulls, uh, your chances of impacting the forest nutrient cycle adversely are very small. Now, if you take hide, hair, feathers, and all, different story. Then you have a chance to uh, maybe get into the uh, some of the micronutrient storage problems, especially where they're in short supply. So, generally speaking, in our unfertile forests, and some aren't, by the way, not all are infertile, uh, but in infertile situations, we do not recommend whole tree harvesting and removal. I think that is the principal way you might cause problems. And for the most part, if you're just taking wood out of the system, you're probably not putting it at, at any grave disadvantage from the standpoint of the nutrient cycle. Okay? Well, the there has been quite a bit of work done on that. Questions from remote sites? I don't understand that answer. Uh, you were talking about the presence of large pieces of wood un under the ground as being contributors to moisture and, and sources of, of various nutrients over the long term. How will you get those large bodies of wood under the ground if you don't have large bowls of trees on the ground? You don't. Uh, obviously, if you have large deposits of decomposed wood deep in soils, then you've had forests on that site for a very long period of time. In most cases, where you have a significant downslope uh, to, uh, to the forest, you do get some movement of soils downslope. And they tend to move down and engulf and bury this wood over time. So that's how you get them deep into the soil profile, in addition to just large, large roots. Obviously, large roots are well buried uh, in the soil profile as well. But this, uh, we made a calculation once, actually, in a subalpine fir system, figure out how many gallons of water per acre there was. And I, as I recall, the figure was around 80,000 gallons of water were stored in wood in uh, late August in that particular site that we were looking at. And so that's a lot of water uh, just to be stored in, in something that when we started out with, we, we didn't expect to even find in these forest soils. We expected it to either be all burned up or decomposed over time. Mm -hmm. It's something that was something a revelation to mm -hmm. see how persistent uh, this stuff was. Does that answer your question? So then what does the removal of large bowls uh, for Okay. Uh, obviously, we have a situation where if you consider the fact that we might, uh, in fairly intensive commercial forestry operations, for example, grow more and more smaller stems to get volumes up, uh, that could, over the long term, create a problem. Because the kind of wood that's persistent remember, has to be fairly large. Uh, not only that, probably the most persistent wood is heartwood of the species I mentioned, Douglas fir, larch, pines. So depending on how you silviculturally approach that system, again, if this is an infertile system, and not all are, uh, you could conceivably run yourself into problems by continuously growing more of smaller stems to get volumes up. So yes, that could be a problem. They could, think couldn't it also be a problem if you remove the, the everything that is old and large that dies? Absolutely. Than letting it fall and, and on the ground. Absolutely. We, we vociferously recommend against that for a long time now. That's not a good idea. Next question. Any more from Legrand? 
Yeah, I, I have to get back to the, the nutrient thing, the other, the other nutrients and stuff. In doing some experiments uh, where I fused the ash on porcelain tiles of different parts of conifers, quite often there's very little difference in the appearance of what's in the sap, wood, and bark on the main part of the stem from what's in the small branches. There is a difference in the way it appears in the foliage. You know, and when you look at the, there is no heartwood in the, the small stems. When you imagine the mineral nutrients that are going up the tree are going up through the sapwood and then coming back down through the cambium, you are removing the stuff. The stuff that's going into the foliage has to come there yes. by way of, it is part of the cycle. Yes. So you are taking things. You are taking some. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I also did a literature search in trying to find out what the research that's been done on fertilizing and not just the Pacific Northwest region, but it is amazing how much research has been done on just a few of the macronutrients and very little is done on the micronutrients. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Most of what's been done has been done with the macronutrients. Uh, the most interesting stuff on forest fertilization, I think, has come out of New Zealand. Uh, they have some forests that are in their second and third rotations over there that started on sites that were not forested. And they're sandy soils. So there's a very tight nutrient cycle there. And uh, Ballard's a name that sticks in my mind. There's a few others. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, that's the literature to go to, yeah. I think, is the most interesting literature, where you're on sandy soils that have very little in terms of any nutrient, including all of the micronutrients, actual storage in the soil itself. So dealing with those forests, the first, the first forest they got was just a wonderful, marvelous forest. And the second was a disaster. And now they've sort of learned how to deal with it to replace the things that, that need to be replaced. And it's uh, the forestry in those New Zealand sites is really fascinating. Another question back in the back. Yeah, I don't know what root rot is, but does it have an effect on nutrient either production or storage in the soils? And another production um, storage question is uh, snags. Do they produce nutrients or store them? Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, a snag, as it's decomposing, standing, uh, is also a pretty fair uh, sponge for nitrogen. Um, and once it falls down, of course, it's, it's going to do its thing just like any other uh, piece of decomposed wood. Uh, so you started the first part of the second. Uh, uh, the first one was on root rot. I don't know oh, what it okay. is, but I read about in, you know, uh, timber sale yes. environmental analysis. And I right. didn't know if it was a microbial function. Right. Well, these are sometimes overly aggressive decomposers. And some of them... Uh, have associated nitrogen fixation, just like with any other decomposer. In fact, it's fairly significant input of nitrogen, for example, from a northern Idaho site that's highly defect prone and full of root rot and f basically falling apart. Uh, you can get a pretty fair amount of nitrogen from that source of decomposition. What's happening here is the decomposers, in this case the root rot, as they decompose the wood and, and, and release the simple energy containing compounds from, from the complex cellulose and, and lignans in the wood, these non-symbiotic fixtures are there and catch any leakage. Uh, most of this decomposition is done with extracellular enzymes. In other words, the, the, the fungi release the enzymes into the tissue. Decomposition happens and then they pull this stuff back. Well, these non-symbiotic Decomposers are right there grabbing it off too. So they're competing with the decomposer for that energy source. And most of the decomposers uh, have enough leakage that a byproduct of that leakage is they are supporting a population of these nitrogen fixing bacteria. So virtually all sources of biological decomposition carry with it this ability to act as a nitrogen sponge. So I guess the simple answer to your question is yes. Go ahead, Bob. The Blue Mountains has a lot of volcanic ash influenced soils that have a real high phosphorus holding capacity. Would you consider those fertile and how important is 
this nutrient cycling in them because one, one particular issue that's come up is particularly in a subalpine fir zone is regeneration on uh, lodgepole pine harvest areas is, is pretty tough. You get real poor regeneration in places. I wonder how much that could be due to nutrient cycling problems on these ash soils. Uh, the ash soils have some very interesting characteristics. Um, with respect to local ash, it depends on a number of things, including the physical nature of the ash. And I would suggest you talk with Mike Geist about that. Right now, he's among the best first uh, in uh, volcanic ash soils of those people that are still currently active. Now, I would say this, that yes, volcanic ash affected soils are much more fertile than the alternatives. They also have much higher water holding capacity. And it's something I should have probably elaborated on a little bit when I had the slide from Arizona up there. Uh, in northern Idaho, we have productivity that's at least one habitat series, maybe two, more productive than the climate could possibly support. But with the water retention and storage ability of that volcanic ash we have up there, uh, we have a great deal more productive forest than the climate would indicate we should have. And managing soils in northern Idaho, certainly, you have to be very cognizant of that volcanic ash, especially when it's there in fairly short supply. So we really get after people to very carefully manage that that ash layer, especially when mechanically treating those soils. Because it's very easy to lose. If you've only got two or three inches of the stuff there, it's very easy to destroy it by mechanically mushing it around. Other questions from remote sites? We're getting kind of close to the end of the evening, so we want to give everybody a chance out there. How about Legrand? Any more from here? Are we winding down? One more call from remote sites. Go ahead. Don't be bashful. We can't see you. Wow. All is quiet. All is quiet. Help me thank uh, Al Harvey for his good presentation. I have a few closing comments here and <laughs> thanks Al you can take a break and we can, we can get your slides later okay one of the things that I want to emphasize a great deal is to sign the sign up sheets here at Legrand and the remote sites we really rely on those heavily for our attendance records and for the facilitators at the remote sites if you take a head count just to give us a double check on that, that would be greatly appreciated. One thing I want to point out again is the, uh, is the publication that Al Harvey is the principal author. And if you're interested, you can get that from the Department of Agriculture, PNW Research Station, PO Box 3890. A little lower? Oh, a little lower, okay. 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 So you can, uh, you can order those. We have some of those at each site, and you can, uh, you can copy the address off the back of those uh, if there aren't enough at the remote sites. Al just gave me another uh, publication, Proceedings, Management, and Productivity of Western Montane Forest Soils. The same thing goes with this one. If you're copying that down, you can do that. And on the back of this, I'm sure there's an address where we can, uh, we can attain that for you. So while you're, while you're doing that, I'll uh, just kind of wrap this up. Next week, we're going to have another continuation of the seminar series. We'll have Mark Ferns, who is from the Department of uh, Minerals and Geology from Baker City. And he's going to address the geology of the Blue Mountains region. And Jim Clayton uh, is coming from the Forestry Lab in uh, Boise. And he's going to be addressing uh, soil formation uh, ex, ex, uh, 
exterior formation of forest soils as well as uh, local uh, forest soil uh, formation. So that should be good. So be, be sure and come with your, your ash protective hat on because he's going to talk about Mount Mazam, I think, probably. One of the guys will be. And that should be pretty exciting. I'm really excited about the seminar series. I'm pleased with your attendance tonight. Uh, we'll have an evaluation form at the end of the series like we did last time. We use those a lot. We, we rely on those for how we should structure the next seminar series. And uh, so keep mental notes about how you, how you like the presentations. And for those folks at the remote sites, if there's some problem that you couldn't hear the questions, and we gathered that from the one comment, let us know about that. If the, if the visuals weren't up to snuff, let us know about that. And, and we'll, we'll talk to the EdNet folks here and, and make sure that that's better next time. Thanks for coming. Appreciate your attendance. Last week, Alan Harvey uh, introduced the, the series with a presentation on soil structure and function. He talked about the various layers of the soil from the organic uh, litter at the ground surface uh, to the inorganic mineral soil uh, so, uh, several layers down. He talked about the organisms involved in nutrient cycling and soil development. And he spoke of how we can care for the soil uh, with better, man better management practices. Uh, this week, we'll focus on uh, the origin of soils, uh, the development, and the geologic evolution. Our first speaker is Mark Ferns, and he is the resident geologist with uh, the Baker City Field Office of the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. He's been with the department now for 15 years, uh, ever since he graduated from the University of Oregon with a Master of Science degree in Geology. He knows an awful lot about the soils of Northeastern Oregon. I know this from a presentation he gave at Sigma Xi that I uh, brought him here to do. Um, and the title of his talk here this evening is The Geologic Evolution of the Blue Mountains Region. Uh, please welcome Mark Ferns.
Well, that's, let me see. Well, before we get started, when, when Mark's getting hooked up there, when we ask questions, be sure and punch. You're fine, you're fine. I'm fine, I'm live? Oh. Be sure and punch down your button. Last time you had somebody punch your button. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, I don't know if you left some reservation about doing this. I've never done anything quite like this. You'll have to bear with me as I try to get organized. When we talk about soils and soil formation, the one thing that we have to consider is the bedrock geology that we're working with. Uh, we have a profile here showing a typical soil profile. Most of what you will cover in this seminar deals with the uh, essentially what us geologists consider to be the skim on the crust, the material that gets in the way of our rocks. <laughs> what, uh, what I'm more interested in is the geologic, what it, on the diagram is referred to as the fresh material, and that evolution of that fresh material. Okay. And the slides should be coming This is your controller. Okay. You'll have to bear with me. Uh, my eyesight is one of the things that happen to people is they grow bald-headed <laughs> and pot belling is that their eyesight begins to go. And I have difficulty telling whether or not the geologic map on the screen is in focus. Geologic maps can tell us a lot about an area. And they can be used to aid in determining what types of soils that you might be dealing with. When we look at geology, we look at two basic types of processes. We look at constructional processes, and we look at erosional processes. Constructional processes are the volcanic, metamorphic, tectonic, and sedimentary processes by which a body of rock is formed. The erosional processes are those by which rock is broken down form sediment, and eventually to form soil. And the geologic map we have here, you know, the Vinegar Hill area near Greenhorn, the yellow units are glacial debris, and they are a type of erosional deposit. The pink unit is a basalt flow. It's important in that the basalt flow is a geochemically and structurally coherent map unit. About everywhere in that pink area, the rock is going to behave the same. And it should break down to form the same types of soils. Other geologic map units, such as the green unit, are a composite of different types of rocks that have been physically juxtaposed. And they have various types of chemical and physical properties. And there you may see a wide range of soils formed. When I, when we look at northeastern Oregon, we look at an area that is geologically young by the standards of the Earth. Although the Earth itself is about four billion years old, the rocks that make up northeastern Oregon are less than 300 million years old. And these oldest rocks were formed in a region far from where they are today. They're part of what we call the exotic terrains, fragments of island arc and ocean floor material that are initially formed in warm marine environments many miles offshore. We have two island arc terrains. In green, we have the Wallawa Seven Devils Arc. In the yellow, we have parts of the Huntington Arc. 
These are volcanic island chains that are separated by a wide expanse of oceanic deep water sediments. Within the island arcs, we find a large variety of different rock types. One thing we find are limestone reefs and shoals, such as the limestone deposit here on Big Bar on Snake River. We also find areas where we have fine grain calcareous sediments that were deposited in basins adjacent to the island arc. These typically weather down into the rounded hills and mountains that are common in the area south of Huntington, this being Bull Run Mountain. To contrast that with the rugged topography of the cores of the island arcs, such as the area near the Iron Dyke Mine on Snake River, the core areas are composed of intrusive and extrusive volcanic rocks. Intrusive volcanic rocks are, are those that rose in the Earth's crust and cooled below the crust. The extrusive rocks are the ones that float out upon the surface as lava flows or as ash flows. The island arc terrains are made up of individual 